Well, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue for one more week this week, today, our essential doctrines. What are we to believe? We're going to culminate with our doctrine of heaven and hell. I think it's been a, a, a good series of teachings, and we've utilized our Baptist faith and message. We'll do that again today. Uh, we've kind of just gone back to those foundational, fundamental truths that are not really that complicated unless we make them complicated. And man, we're good at making things complicated. We've been working through uh, what I'm calling essential doctrines of our faith. They're what give us a foundation. They keep us grounded so that we're not carried away by uh, opposition, oppositional philosophies. We're not carried away by half-truths or fake news or deceptions. And we don't lose our mind even over the misguided religious beliefs of a fallen world. And look, we have those. Uh, even in our own denomination, we've had some times in our past and likely in our future where we just got off track a little bit, and we were misguided because of the brokenness of this world. Now, interestingly enough, I'm going to change subject real fast here. You've likely heard this statement, silence is complicity. Who's heard that? Silence is complicity. Yeah, it's starting to kind of make its way through our culture, and it, it's being presented as if it's absolutely true, that if you remain silent on the issue of the day, then you are saying it's okay. And uh, there, I guess there's some truth to that, a little bit. Um, but you've also heard this, silence is golden, <laughs> right? Especially if you've worked in the nursery. <laughs> silence is gold, <laughs> really is. There's some good, good truth in that. Um, you've heard silence is necessary. You've probably heard that statement. And there's some truth in that. Sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut. Uh, matter of fact, th that's very biblical. It, it, said, it said Jesus made no sound, said nothing as they led him to be slaughtered, to be killed. Um, silence sometimes is necessary. Sometimes it's golden. Sometimes it's complicity. The reason I bring that up is because often we've been told to keep our faith to ourselves. Um, to not talk about things that might confront or be confrontational to others and their opinions and the way they see things. And that we are being um, uh, overbearing or judgmental when we talk about certain aspects of our faith and that there's no place for that in the public square. So on one hand, you get a crowd of people saying silence is complicity. If you don't speak up, then you agree with all, whatever it is, the negative, the hatred, the wickedness. And then this very same crowd turns around and says, hey, quit talking about that religious stuff. Be quiet. Have you, have you noticed that? That frustrates me. One way or the other. Tell me to be quiet or tell me to speak up, but don't tell me both. I, I'm confused. Our foundational doctrinal truths are at some point going to require us to speak up. And at other points... To be quiet. <laughs> uh, that's hard for me. That's a challenge. I get confused. When to speak and when not to speak. Scripture says be slow to speak. Right? Quick to listen. But we also know there's other times when we've got to stand up and speak. Today we're going to talk about one of those topics. Uh, one side of the topic today in particular that people don't want to hear a whole lot about. That's hell. It's even hard to say it out loud. Hell. It, you're not supposed to say that. It's improper. It's almost a bad word. You're not supposed to use it in certain circumstances. But we're going to talk about this place today. Uh, our kids video did a, a, a great job of talking about the other place we're going to talk about, heaven. So let's do that. Why don't you turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be like in verses 31 through 46, so a little bit uh, down the road in 25. And while you're doing that, I'm going to read to you 
our Baptist Faith and Message foundational statement on heaven and hell. Here it is. God, in his own time and in his own way, will bring the world to its appropriate end. Uh, let me veer off. The song we just sang, um, um, Jesus was going to be hung on a tree. Right? That's scriptural. That's prophecy. You might also get the translation of a pole. To be hung on a pole is to be cursed and to be hung on a tree. And we know that the cross that Christ was likely hung on was not a living tree, but one, a, a cut-down tree that had been fashioned into a, a cross. Sometimes the Bible uses words like tree, and we would probably have preferred to just said cross. But a cross in ancient biblical times, Old Testament times, wouldn't have made any sense. Right? Because they didn't have that form of, of execution in that day. So the scripture writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said a tree. And I think they even missed that probably. We would have too. We wouldn't have known what that was talking about likely. Isn't it fascinating that words sometimes inspire and sometimes create um, uh, hatred and words are so powerful and sometimes we get hung up on words <laughs> and we start thinking that the words themselves are what's the message and we say well if it doesn't say cross then it must not have been referring to the actual crucifixion because it says tree and it wasn't a tree literally it was it was just a, some wood that was formerly was you see how we can complicate things God in his own time and in his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. Is it going to be through global warming? I don't know. Maybe. An appropriate end. I think we can be assured it's not going to be through a flood. He said he wasn't going to do that again. He did that once, wiped the face of the earth, all but Noah and his family, all the animals, all the trees. Even the flies, I don't think, could fly around long enough before they went diving into the ocean, into the waters. He killed it all through a flood. He said he's not going to do that again. And I think we can feel fairly certain it's going to be through fire. How is that fire going to come? I don't know. Global warming, perhaps. Are we going to stop it? No. He's going to bring it into the world in an appropriate way. And we are not going to stop it. We might stop global warming. But that won't be the way he brings the world to an end. <laughs> He's going to do it how he chooses to do it. According to his promise, Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly in glory to the earth. These are big words. Personally and visibly come straight out of Scripture. The dead will be raised straight from Scripture. And Christ will judge all men in righteousness. Marvin read that for us this morning. We're going to read it again here in a minute. Christ will judge all men in righteousness. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them. Christ will do that. The Son of Man, as we'll read here momentarily. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell. The place of everlasting punishment. These words, everlasting punishment. A place. It has a name, hell. Hell. That's the English version, as we'll see here in a minute, of, of the Hebrew and the, and the Greek and uh, uh, multiple forms of words used throughout Scripture to refer to this eternal place of punishment. The righteous and the resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. This is our Baptist Faith and Message 2000. As you know, as we've been going through this for a while, this is a statement based on large Amounts of Scripture. Your, your best practice in Scripture is to let Scripture um, interpret Scripture. So you find a passage and you go, I wonder if this is talking about hell. Do some more research in the Bible and see if it is referring to hell or heaven or any other topic that you come across. Let the Bible interpret it for you. Sometimes we let other people interpret it for us, and that could be good if, they, if they're solid biblically conservative you know they they have a good strong foundation but there's a lot of stuff out there that is not biblically grounded and yet they present aspects of scripture as truth 
And if we turn to them for our foundational truths, we're going to get a lot confused. So let Scripture interpret Scripture. I, I, I feel pretty confident, there'd be those who'd argue with me, that the Baptist faith and message is based on Scripture. It's really pretty short, and it uses the same words that come straight out of verses. So I feel pretty confident. It didn't get real long, because the longer we start making doctrinal statements, <laughs> the more we mess it up. We don't want to do that. We want to keep it fairly Short, concise statements based on large amounts of Scripture that interpret each other. We hit the kind of the firm, foundational, conservative components. I use the word conservative, not in the political sense, though there's some application there. But just the idea that it's trusted. Uh, there's a better word in the religious circles that the word is orthodox. That it's just kind of the, the teaching that's been passed on over time that thousands of biblical students and Smart people have put together and they trust. They've prayed about it and they've studied and, and they've passed it down to us. And they do it through humility as Marvin prayed for us. That we would be humble as we interpret God's word. Not thinking we already know so much. And they've passed down this conservative foundational truths. Trustworthy. Because the opposite of conservative is kind of the progressive idea. Or or. The liberal idea, right? If I, if I go and, and I want to eat a meal and I want a, a very large meal, right? we would say, uh, eat all you can eat. That would be a very liberal application to our meal or, or suntan lotion. Put it on liberally. Put a lot on. Sometimes we do that with Scripture. We begin to just pile on all this other stuff liberally. And we get, we get some really confusing doctrines. So I use the word conservative. I think it's just a safe word. Orthodox would be the religious word. We want to be able to stand on these foundational truths, and we want to trust that they are fairly straightforward, conservative, the best we can. Because, look, there's some chapters in the Bible that are just really, really hard. Isaiah 65, don't look at it now. Go home, look up Isaiah 65, and when you got it figured out, come tell me. Because I'm not sure what they're talking about there. Matthew chapter 25, 31 through 46. I think we can know what he's talking about. Let's read it. <clears throat> Matthew 25. I didn't mark my Bible. Give me a second. I told you to put your finger in there. but Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Um, Son of Man a term Jesus most often used to refer to himself. This individual that we find in the Old Testament also, a reference, a prophecy of one who will save Israel from their problems, their future problems. A son of man, it's a, a reference to this kind of supernatural, looks like a man, but, but actually is something greater than that. You'll find it in the Old Testament. Jesus uses son of man most often to refer to himself. And in this case, he says that individual, the Son of Man, he'll come in his glory and all the angels will be with him and he will sit on his glorious throne. You've likely heard that Jesus never said he was God's Son because he used the term Son of Man. But look what it says. You know, when Scripture interprets Scripture, we get some clarity. Somebody said he never said he was God's Son. But he pretty much said he's going to come with all the angels, and well, the Son of Man is going to come with all the angels, and he will sit on his glorious throne. So when he refers to himself as the Son of Man, he's saying he's this person who's going to come in glory with all the angels and sit on the throne of God. That's what he's saying. They didn't miss that. We miss it sometimes because somebody makes it complicated. Well, Son of Man is actually a reference to Daniel and it, it actually was King so-and-so. Not, not probably, no. Son of Man is God's Son, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Savior. The one who will judge, as we'll read in just a second. He says it right there. Don't be confused by Son of Man. It's the term he used. Probably used it because he would know that all his audience, Jewish men and women, would understand the reference. If they knew the Old Testament prophecies, they would know that language. 
and they would know of who it referred to. You know, another good piece of evidence that they knew who he was talking about and that he was referring to himself and that it was God's son, they killed him because of it. They said he committed blasphemy. He has said he's God's son. And that's punishable by death. And they killed him because of his blasphemy. They knew what he was talking about. You'll get some commentaries. You'll get some devotional books. They don't know what they're talking about. Because <laughs> it says very clearly, Son of Man will come in his glory. Well, we harp on that a little more. Hey, 32. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. That's not a political statement. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you... Yeah, that would be terrible if we tried to make that into a political statement. That is not a political statement. It's funny, though. <laughs> then the king will say to those on this right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needed clothing, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply. Notice how it went from the son of man. He'll gather all nations. He'll separate. The son of man will do these things. And now the term is capital letter king. Same individual. The king will reply. Truly I tell you, whatever you do, did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whenever you did not for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So a little sidebar there, language, um, prophetic words, words like tree and a reference to an actual cross. These are all things God has utilized to try to reveal to us um, His will and His methods and His ways. And we get confused, rightfully so. It, it's, it's hard sometimes to know exactly what He's talking about. Son of man turns into the king. And we get a reference to dividing one group to eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. One, to eternal life. Two different places. So we want to let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we want to make sure that we're understanding fully what we read, or the best we can. And if you're not careful, this passage in particular, it might lead you to think that somehow we have to work to get put on the right and to eternal life. And if we don't do enough good deeds, good works, we'll be put on the left. This is my left, so you guys all are eternal punishment. And this is my right, you guys are all eternal life. Thank you very much. You worked and you didn't work. This passage might lead you to believe that. Because that's what it says, right? It's hard. It's complicated. We want to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Does this align with other Scripture? Is our salvation based on works? Our eternal resting place. According to this, if we were to just open the Bible the first time to ever look at it, and we read this, we might start thinking, I better go out and clothe the clothless and feed the hungry, and, and then maybe God will accept me, and I'll be one of those chosen for eternal life. That's happened. Lots of uh, various uh, religious people with good intentions have made whether our eternal resting place is based on our works, our good works. Others have said, well, that doesn't align with everything in Scripture. 
there's a contradiction. And, and we believe last week we were supposed to be taught that <laughs> Scripture is, is um, inerrant and it does not contradict, but I didn't get there. Um, that's my fault. Uh, well, it's the Internet's fault a little bit. But that was going to be the message that we trust Scripture to not contradict itself. So how do we harmonize this passage with a passage like um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? You know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace you have been saved. It's a gift of God. It's not through good works. How would that verse then uh, align or harmonize with Matthew 25? Well, there, there's two teachings going on here. They don't contradict each other. They are in harmony with one another. And we would teach that it isn't good works that ultimately lead to our eternal destination, but rather it's God's good grace and our faith in Jesus. That's not the only verse. That's just kind of the most specific one, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There's lots of other scriptures that would say putting our faith in Christ and what he has done, his good work, is what saves us, not our good works. You know, but even in this passage, right, even in this passage in Matthew 25, what do we find there? It says, those that are on my right, you fed me and, and gave me something to drink and clothed me. And then they go, when? You see, their motivation for feeding and clothing and visiting in the hospital was not based on maybe God will accept me. Right? Their motivation wasn't salvation. God will bring me to eternal life. They didn't even know when they did these things. They said, when did we do this? And he said, when you did it for the least of those, you did it for me. And the other group too. They're probably thinking, well, we didn't know that was the way to get in the gates. We didn't know that was the key to get into heaven to do good works. We would have done them. If you'd have told us that was the key, but God never said that was the key. And they didn't know that was key because it ain't the key. And they didn't do those good works. And there's something to be said about people who don't care about people. You know what is said about those people? They don't have any love. What the world could use is a little more love. Where does love come from? God. People who have been filled with God, love. People who are angry at God, people who dismiss God, they struggle to show love. Primarily because everything becomes about themselves. It's very self-centered. God said, my son sacrificed himself, be like him. Think more highly of others than you think of yourself. Love others more than you love yourself. Love comes from God. Those who love are an indication that they have God. We just kind of talked about it in Sunday school. It was right there in 1 John. Isn't it interesting that um, the scripture even says here, even though it kind of sounds like it's a works-based, that they didn't even know that's what was the key and because it wasn't the key. God never revealed that. And he separates into two places. These are very real places. One's called hell, one's called heaven. And they have some um, foundation in Scripture. Um, in the Old Testament, hell, you don't find the word hell very much. You find the word sheol, S-H-E-O-L. You've heard that before. You've seen it. You've probably heard messages on it before. Sheol, it's a reference to the place of the dead. And there are some Scriptures that say that it's a place of fire and torment. For those who are wicked, Deuteronomy chapter 32, 22 refers to God's anger as a consuming fire that reaches Sheol. That is a place where the dead are being uh, tormented by fire. Prophet Isaiah, he refers to Sheol as a place where the strong in this world, the self-righteous, the, uh, the non-God-fearers, the powerful nations who ignore God, and who claim divinity for themselves, that there's this place reserved for them, the wicked, where they'll find out that they're actually weak and that there is no power in them. They'll be separated from God for eternity. 
Sheol is referred to 65 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's a place of the dead. Sometimes it's a place of eternal punishment. Your homework is to look it up, all 65 of them. In the New Testament, there's a Greek term used for hell. It's Hades. Hades, uh, very much a Greek term, come out of their own religion, the Greek religions. A uh, place reserved for the, the fallen, right? The god Hades, he was a fallen god, little g-god. He, he was the bad guy, the enemy. The, he was the, the worst of the siblings of the Greek gods, and he was sent to a place where he couldn't escape. And he was down there to, to force harm on the world. And so the biblical writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, used the term Hades to refer to this eternal place, hell. That's the English version. There's another term, it's in, from Hebrew, found in the New Testament. It's Gehenna. You, you've heard Gehenna. It's a, a, a loose, loose translation of a place outside of Jerusalem. A place where the trash was taken. The trash from Jerusalem would be taken out into this valley outside the city, and it would be burned. And there was so much trash that the fire never went out. It was just constantly burning. It was the Valley of Hanon. It became known as Gehenna. The place where all the trash, the filth, the refuge, the bad stuff would go to be burned. Biblical writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit refer to hell as Gehenna. Gehenna, and it's loosely translated to English as hell. A place where the fire will never be consumed. It'll just burn forever. Never satisfied. Remember, words matter, and, and we're trying to let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we hear tree, and we now know that it was a, a crucifix, and, and we hear Gehenna, and we, uh, our minds go to this fire that's never quenched, and we go, is that going to be hell? And we come to these Scripture passages here in Matthew 25, and it says eternal punishment. And we remember that God said, I'll never flood the earth again. The next time I come to destroy the earth, it will be with fire. And we get additional references in Revelation about the lake of fire and hell, the valley of Hinnon, Gehenna, Hades, terms that those who heard this message would have understood. And I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating to me, too, that we come to these passages and we look and we go, why can't he just be clear? Don't, don't do that. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Don't, don't do what I do and say, why can't God just be more clear? Because there's this passage in Luke that's going to make me feel pretty stupid. Luke chapter 16 Starting in verse 19, we get a parable from God, from Jesus, that reminds us that he has been clear. Heaven and hell are real places. Don't question that. It's true. Look what he says here in verse 19 of Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked the sores. The time came from the beggar, when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Maybe you have Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, there it is, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham from far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, oh, that's tough. Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm. It has been set in place 
So those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. If you're like me, sometimes you say, why can't God just be more clear? Just tell me there's heaven and hell. How do I get to heaven? How do I get to hell? Why do I got to read all the pages? Just give me a summary. Tell me exactly. I'll do it. I'll believe. Well, he did. God did tell us. He told us first through the prophets and Moses. Then he told us through Jesus, the revelation of, and fulfillment of all the prophecies. And Jesus did die and come back from the dead to tell us how we can know our eternal resting place. And yet some people are never going to believe. Never going to believe. They're never going to believe. Why? Well, it's not clear. I'm just confused. I just don't know. Well, it says he's a loving God. Well, I don't want to be like Lazarus. I don't want to lay and beg at somebody's street. If that's what it takes to go to heaven, I don't want to live that life. Well, <laughs> the casual reading of Luke would say you got to be a beggar to get to heaven. But that, we know that's not true. We read the other pages of Scripture. It's just an analogy. It's a parable. It's trying to give us a truth that either we can trust by faith or we dismiss for whatever reason. You see, he's illustrating how we always want proof. But he's already given us all we need to know. He's already proven his love his holiness, there is eternity, there's a way, our kids' video said it, John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's already told us, it's already been revealed. There are these two places, Abraham's side, that's a reference to heaven, Abraham's bosom, and Hades, a reference to hell. Two people, one goes to heaven, one goes to hell. Lazarus goes to heaven, Abraham's bosom. The rich man goes to hell. We say, well, I'll, I'll just give up all my money. I don't want to go to hell. Rich people go to hell. Some do, I guess. Some rich people probably go to heaven because we know the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And Father Abraham himself was very wealthy. There's one in hell. He desires nothing more than to warn his family of the coming judgment. But God tells him, even if somebody came back from the dead, and somebody will, it'll be my son, they still won't believe. Two places, heaven and hell, real, we can know one or the other. God has given us an, a, a choice. I know the Bible can be hard and complicated, and you go through certain passages and it's tough. I, I, I encourage you to let Scripture interpret Scripture and and when it says these things, go back and read more and, and, and see if you can understand better and ask the good questions and spend the time because our eternity is dependent on it. You can know for sure which place you're going to go to, heaven or hell, as our kids' video suggested. And I invite you to make that decision today. Our team's going to come. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If you've not decided and, and believe, put your faith in Jesus, the only way to eternal life, today's the day to do that. If, if you're confused about heaven and hell, let Scripture uh, teach and, and clarify. And if you've got concerns or questions, you can come up and visit with me. 
Let's pray as they set up and we'll sing one last song. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, you're good to us. God, your name and your position of authority and sovereignty above all things. God, we look to you as you sit on your throne. And God, as you've revealed to us your love through Jesus, God, we're so thankful that you have um, sent him to die for our sins. That we can trust him and God, that he can secure our eternity forever with you. And God, then we can be motivated to do good works because of what you've done in our lives. And God, I'm thankful for this church and the ministry it's had in this community and across the world. I ask you to continue to bless this group. And God, I'm thankful for those who've made the commitment to be here this morning. And God, we pray that if somebody's confused about their eternity, that you will impress upon their heart today and they'll make a decision.